In this video, we're going to go over four problems from sections 4, 3, and 4, 4, uh, very similar to what you're going to see on the test. So the first problem here, it says, at part A, find the critical numbers of the function, if there are any. Part B, find the open interval or intervals on which the function is increasing or decreasing. And then apply that first derivative test to identify all relative extrema. So in this one, through to find part A, find the critical numbers. We take the derivative, set the derivative equal to zero. So f prime of x is going to equal negative 4x plus 4. And we set that equal to zero. And on the left side here, we can factor. Let's pull out a negative 4. And then we're left with x minus 1. So if we set the negative 4 equal to 0, you know that does nothing, but we set this term here, x minus 1 equals 0, means x equals 1 is a critical number. So for part A, we know the only critical number here is x equals 1. And remember, this critical number is going to chop up our function into intervals where it's increasing or decreasing. Uh, part B, find the intervals on which the function increases or decreases. So if we come down here to the box, we know that uh, this function, it's defined everywhere. So we know our first interval goes from negative infinity to our critical number of 1. And then from 1, we head off toward positive infinity. So there's part B. We found the intervals uh, on which we might be increasing or decreasing. Now the first derivative. Right here, I'll underline it in black. We're going to pick a point from each interval and test it in the first derivative to see if we are increasing or decreasing. If we get a positive output from the first derivative, remember, positive slope means our graph would be going uphill or increasing. If we get a negative output from that first derivative, negative slopes go downhill. So on that interval, we, we would be decreasing. So let's see here. Uh, in this interval, if I plug the number uh, 0 in, I'm going to use a test value of 0. If I plug that here into the first derivative, negative 4 times 0 is 0, plus 4 would be 4. So our sign is positive. The 4 doesn't matter, just the, the sign of it. We know that from negative infinity to positive 1, we have a positive derivative, and that means our function is increasing. Our function is going uphill over that interval. If I take a number between 1 and infinity, let's say positive 5, and I plug a 5 in for x, uh, 5 times negative 4 is negative 20, plus 4, that would be a negative 16. And again, the 16 doesn't matter, just the value. We know it has a negative derivative from 1 to infinity. And if it has a negative derivative, that means the function is decreasing over that interval. So let's see what's happening. You know, this we identified as the critical number that chopped up our interval. So here at x equals 1, something's going on. We know on the left side of this critical number, our function is increasing. And then we hit the critical number 1. And on the other side, our function is decreasing. So what we know is there's a hill there. And if there's a hill, that means our critical number is at the top of that hill, or it's a relative max. So here we have a relative max. And again, this critical number is just the x-coordinate. So I know it's 1 comma something is the max. If I want to find that y-coordinate, I plug this x value into the original function. f of 1, if we plug 1 in here, out pops a 5. So 1 comma 5 is our relative max. Now problem number two is going to be the same type of problem. We're going to find the same things, the critical numbers, the intervals on which we increase or decrease, and apply that first derivative test. This function was a simple polynomial. Then the second one, we're going to have a, a trig function. But the idea is exactly the same. So first we need our derivative, and we're going to set that equal to 0. So f prime of x. You know, this x over 2, that's just another way to write 1 half x. And if I take the derivative of 1 half x, that is just 1 half. And then we have our cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So there's our first derivative, and again, we want to set this equal to 0. 
Now we're used to factoring something out, but that's not going to work here. We do have just a number, a fraction, and a trig function. Let's add sine to both sides of this equation. So we're going to have 1 half equals sine of x. Sine of x equals 1 half. Now here's where we want to think back to pre-calc or the unit circle. There's a couple spots where we have an x value of 1 half. Or a sine value of 1 half. Now remember sine is paired up with the y coordinate. And this is a positive 1 half. So we know for sure we're in the top half up here. We're either in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. What angles give us a sine value of a half? Well that would be 30 degrees or in radians, pi over 6. And then also the reflection around the y-axis over here on the other side, and that would be 5, 6 pi, because it's one pi, uh, pi radians for half a circle. So this would be 5, 6 pi. You know, here we would have our x-coordinate would be the square root of 3 over 2. Our y-value or our sine value would be 1 half. Over here on the other side, the reflection, our x-coordinate would be negative, negative square root of 3 over 2, but our y-value would still be the positive 1 half. So this occurs at x equals pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. There are the critical numbers of this function. And these critical numbers, of course, chop up our intervals. So let's see here. Oop, and I should have stipulated. We're just interested in between 0 and 2 pi. So our first interval is going to go from 0 to the first critical number, 6 pi radians. And then our next interval goes from a 6 pi radians to 5 6 pi radians. And then finally from 5 6 pi radians to 2 pi. So there's our intervals chopped up. We're going to take a a test value in each interval, plug it into that derivative, and see what comes out. So in my first interval here between 0 and a 6th pi, you know I can take uh, maybe an 8th pi radians. Somewhere here in this middle interval, a uh, good one that will be right on our unit circle is a half pi radians. And our final interval we can use uh, 1 pi radians. So remember we are plugging these into the first derivative. And I'm going to come up here. Here's my uh, x values, my critical numbers, pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. And now we're going to do our test. When I take this 8th pi radians and plug it into the first derivative right here, the sine of 8th pi radians is definitely smaller than 1 half. Uh, and then a half minus something less than a half is definitely going to be a positive output. And that tells us our function is increasing across that interval. Uh, between, uh, in this interval, we're going to use a half pi radians. So here in our first derivative, we're going to have one half minus the sine of a half pi radians. The si sine of a half pi radians is one. Half minus one is definitely negative. And that tells us our function is decreasing. And then finally, we're going to do 1 pi radians. Plug that into our derivative. We're going to have a half minus the sine of pi radians is 0. Half minus 0 is a half, and it's definitely positive, which tells us our function is increasing across that interval. So at our first critical number here, at pi over 6 radians, to the left of this value, our function was increasing. And then we hit this critical number, and on the other side, we were decreasing. So it looks like this critical number is at the top of a hill. This is going to be a local max. So I'll come up here, max, relative max. At the next critical number, here at 5, 6 pi radians, to the left, we were decreasing. Then we hit the critical number, and on the other side, we were increasing. So it looks like here we have a valley, and we're at the bottom of that valley, which means we have a relative min value. And if we want to get these y coordinates that are paired up with our critical numbers, we would plug this pi over 6 into the original function. 
And I just have these in decimal form. When I plug that pi over 6 in, I get out a value of 1.1278. And when I plug the 5, 6 pi radians in, I get 0.44297. So there's the exact x and y coordinates of our, our uh, mins and maxes. The first one here is a relative max. second one is a relative min. All right, here on question three, now we're going to switch to section 4.4, four, and we're looking for possible points of inflection, and we're going to talk about the concavity of the graph. So we're going to need, in this one, the second derivative. So our first derivative, f prime of x, is the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So there is our first derivative. And again, for points of inflection, to find the possible points of inflection, we take the second derivative and set that equal to zero. So we have our first. Let's find f double prime. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. And the derivative of sine is cosine. And we're going to set this second derivative equal to zero. And let's see here, I can either add sine of x to both sides or add co cosine of x to both sides. It doesn't really matter. I'll just add the cosine to both sides. So we're going to have the negative sine of x is equal to the positive cosine of x. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, if we think back to the unit circle, uh, at all the 45 degree angles, we have x and y values that are identical. Uh, in the first quadrant, it's the square root of 2 over 2, comma, root 2 over 2. In the fourth quadrant, our x value is still positive, our y value is negative. In the second quadrant, our x value is negative, our y value is positive. And in the third quadrant, they're both negative. Square root of 2 over 2 negative, and square root of 2 over 2 negative. What we're saying here is, where are sine and cosine exactly the same, except one of them's negative while the other is positive? Well, again, here in the third quadrant, they're both negative, so that doesn't work. Here in the first quadrant, they're both positive. That doesn't fulfill what we're looking for. But in the other two, we have one of them's positive, the other one is negative. One of them's positive, the other one is negative. So these are the angles that we're looking for. And what uh, radian measure angle gives us this? Well, here would be a half pi. So this would be 3 quarter pi, 3 fourths pi radians. And down here in the fourth quadrant, remember an entire lap is 2 pi. So this would be 7 fourths pi. or just a quarter pi short of a full revolution. So here are the two uh, possible points of inflection for the graph. Just because we set our second derivative equal to zero and solve for these, it doesn't guarantee points of inflection, but it's points that we are suspicious of. So I'm going to come up here again, my x coordinates. We have just found 3 fourths pi radians and 7 fourths pi radians. So these chopped up our intervals. We're going to go from 0 to 2 pi, so we start at 0, and go to 3 fourths pi radians. And then we pick up at 3 fourths pi radians and go to the next critical number, 7 fourths pi. And then from that critical number, 7 fourths pi, or not critical number, possible point of inflection, we finish off the interval at 2 pi. Now what we do here is test the second derivative. We're going to pick a test uh, point in each interval, plug it into the second derivative, and determine if we are concave up or concave down. So here in the first interval, and you know, a nice one to use might be uh, a half pi radians. So when we go to the second derivative, negative sine of a half pi. See, sine of a half pi, we're at the you know, upper positive y-axis. That coordinate is 0, comma 1. So our sine value is 1. We have negative, and then that sine of that is 1. Minus 
the cosine at that same value. Cosine there is 0. Negative 1 minus 0 is negative 1, and again, we're only concerned with the sine. Across that interval, we have a negative second derivative. Negative second derivative tells us we are concave down. In the next interval, let's see, between 3 fourths pi and 7 fourths pi, pi radians would be a good one. You know, now we're here on the negative x part of the axis. We have our coordinate at negative 1, 0. So when we plug this into the second derivative, we're going to have negative sine. Well, our sine value is 0. So sort of negative 0, and then minus the cosine at that point. Our cosine is negative 1. So this negative 0 is nothing. Minus a negative 1, we add the opposite, we get positive. A positive second derivative tells us we are concave up across that interval. And then finally, between 7 fourths pi and 2 pi, um, well, we could pick probably anything in there. Uh, 11 sixth pi. So again, we're plugging that into the second derivative at negative 11 sixth pi. Let's see, our sine value is negative a half. Our sine value, so we're going to have negative negative a half minus the cosine value there would be the square root of 3 over 2. So the negative negative 1 half is positive 1 half minus root 3 over 2, and that's definitely going to be negative. So here's another interval, negative second derivative means concave down. So are these points of inflection or not? You know, when we took the second derivative and set it equal to 0, I said those are possible points of inflection. Well, let's see. Here at this 3 fourths pi, at that possible point of inflection, to the left we are concave down, and then we hit the point of inflection and we switch to concave up. That's the definition of a point of concavity a point at which our concavity switches. So this 3 fourths pi radian is a point of inflection. For the next one, here at 7 fourths pi radian, to the left we were concave up, we hit the point, and then we're concave down. So this is also a point of inflection. And these are just the x-coordinates. If we do want to find the y-coordinates, we would plug those values into the original function, f of x. And if we do that here for the first one, the sine value would be positive root 2 over 2, plus a negative cosine at that value would be root 2 over 2 negative. We add those, we get 0. And that's going to be the same story when we go to the uh, 7 fourths pi. They're the same except in sign. They're going to add up to be 0. So there are the x and y coordinates of our two known points of inflection. Uh, this last problem is just the second derivative test. We want to find the relative extrema and use the second derivative test if we can. So our first step is to find the critical numbers. We want to set the first derivative equal to 0. And here our first derivative is 3x squared minus 18x plus 27. And we're setting that equal to 0. Uh, it's going to get a little easier to factor if we pull the 3 out. So pull that 3 out, and then we'll have a negative 6x plus 9, and that's equal to 0. And that what's in the parentheses there will break down farther. So what would that be? The factors of 9 that add up to negative 6. Well, that'd be x minus 3 and x minus 3. So when we set each of these terms equal to 0, you know that's just a coefficient. It means nothing. When we set x minus 3 equal to 0, we get a critical number of x equals 3. And if we plug this, you know, or set this equal to 0, we get the exact same thing. It's just sort of a repeat. So we have our one and only critical number at x equals 3. What are we going to do with that critical number? We're going to plug it into the second derivative. So we have our first derivative. We're just going to find the second. f double prime of x. That would be 6x minus 18. And remember, we're not setting this equal to 0. Uh, we're not looking for possible points of inflection. We're just going to plug the critical number in there and see if we get a positive or negative output. 
So f double prime of 3, that's equal to 6 times 3 minus 18, which is 18 minus 18, and that gives us an output of 0. Uh-oh, the test has failed. Remember, if we plug our, se our critical number into the second derivative, if we get a positive output, we're concave up, and that means we're at the bottom of a valley or we have a min. If we get a negative second derivative output, we're concave down, and our critical number is at the top of that hill, it would be a relative max. In this case, our second derivative did equal 0. The test has failed. But have no fear, we can go back and do the first derivative test. So. Our critical number 3 has chopped up our intervals for the first derivative test. We're going to go from negative infinity to our critical number of 3, and then from 3 to positive infinity. So these are our intervals. Now we're going to plug a test number from each interval into the first derivative and see if we get a positive or negative output. So let's see here for a good one between negative infinity and 3. If it's available, use 0. Makes it very easy. It'll wipe out any x terms. So we come back to the first derivative. These two are wiped out by the 0, and we're left with a positive 27. So the sine of f prime of x is positive. And that means our function is increasing on the interval from negative infinity to 3. Uh, between 3 and positive infinity. Pick any number in there. Uh, see, I picked 10. And then we'll have 3 times 10 squared. 10 squared is 100. That makes it 300. Minus 10 times 18 is 180. That's going to be a positive 120 plus 27. Maintains positive. So we have another po uh, positive first derivative, and that means our function is increasing. So is this point of 3 uh, a min or a max? Is it an extrema? Uh, for positive on the left and positive on the right, it's neither. You know, our graph was going up. We did hit a flat spot, and then we continued going up. Uh, and a little hint here on the real test. Uh, the, in problem 4, the second derivative test will not fail on the real test. Uh, if you got your TI-89 graphing calculator, graph this function and check it out. It's very interesting. Uh, you know, if you look at it, we have our x and y axes. It'll be hard to get a good look at it in the window because if we plug in negative values of x, our first term is negative. We'll subtract more and that'll be even more negative. And then 27 times a negative number will be more negative. So this graph drops very quickly. It'll be very tight to the y axis in the third quadrant when we start plugging in positive values. It is going to take off very sharp, very steep going up, and we do kind of have a flat spot above x equals 3. Again, on the graph, it'll be very hard to see that, almost impossible unless you zoom in really steep. But we are increasing, increasing. There is one spot where that derivative levels off, but then it goes right back to increasing. So we're increasing on the left and right side of an x value of 3, that critical number. So it's not a min or a max. You know, we're here we're not at the top of a hill or at the bottom of a valley. Our second derivative test did fail, and the first derivative test showed us why, because it wasn't an extrema at all.